Uh, thank you very much for being here uh, with us still for the third interview today with Inna Shevchenko. I just practiced that. <laughs> My name is Janta Mosselman. I'm a program editor here at the Bali um, and your moderator for this conversation. Uh, Inna, thank you so much for being here uh, tonight with us. I will briefly introduce you. You are the leader of FEMIN, activist against various manifestations of patriarchy, including dictatorship, religion and the sex industry. And you've been kidnapped and threatened by the Belarus KGB in 2011, um, given political asylum in France. Um, and you have already done so much uh, uh, in this early stage of your life. And I'm really, really honored uh, to be interviewing here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to start with something, because you were born right after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and in an interview, you, you told that women were working also men's jobs during the Soviet Union. And then uh, currently, this, this, to this day, this day, you say that um, in Ukraine, women can become two things, either a housewife or a prostitute. So how did that happen? How did you go to that as a country? You know, I think when um, there is often, it's often said that during the... Um, um, USSR time, there was some sort of gender equality, um, which, for example, in the contrast of Ukraine of our time, of today, the situation is very different. Um, in my um, view, if we could, if we can say, and if we can indeed keep the statement that in USSR there was a gender equality, then the gender equality was indeed only in one area, and it's in the labor market. Mm -hmm. Indeed, women and men equally were considered working force. There was no discrimination um, in the labor market. Mm -hmm. Yet, women had, women were actually, as everywhere else, um, the workers that work twice more, because they worked, they built the railroads, mm -hmm. they built the buildings in the USSR, yet they still took care of household, of children, and so on and so forth. So if there was a gender equality in USSR, then it's only on the labor market. Everywhere beyond that, um, you know, the, the, the inequality and discrimination and exploitation of women uh, was persisting, and that's what Ukraine of today also inherited from that time. Mm -hmm. And that's why, for example, you know, when people say, oh, in USSR there was a lot of, there was just gender equal society, how come you went that bad, you know, on such a bad uh, stage as today, uh, where the, so the society is. But indeed, we inherited a lot of in inequalities from the Soviet time as well. Would you say that it's like that, that it's gotten worse? It did get worse, of course. Um, it did get worse uh, because of the collapse of USSR, of course, or following, rather, following the collapse mm -hmm. of USSR. Um, and it got worse because um, the country suddenly, as all other 15 uh, states, um, suddenly found itself, the society found itself out in a, in a political, economic, um, and social crisis. And as during any crisis, Women are always those who suffer double uh, punishment. And I will be honest, I remember as a child, I was suffering from seeing my father and mother suffering, from seeing my father and mother struggling to make a minimum for us, to provide a minimum for me and my sister. Mm -hmm. And I remember how my father suffered from that situation. But I also remember that my mother suffered double. And uh, it's really the question of gender uh, suddenly became very actual in the time of crisis. And I think that it's in any, during any crisis, woman is always getting this double punishment. And the question of gender becomes very actual in those times. And to get it straight, so there were not, there were hardly any jobs left. And the jobs that were left, they were taken by men. Exactly. And uh, the jobs that were left, they were taken by men. And the new jobs, let's say, let's call it jobs, mm -hmm. the new jobs were created, the crimi criminal jobs, the illegal jobs, right? The mafia that was self-organized. And of course, those, um, this was taken over by men as well. And women, so men were those um, who were owning you know, brothels, and women were those who were exploited in those 
brothels. M there were men who were uh, opening illegally uh, all sorts of uh, businesses, illegal businesses, and, and, and women were the ones who were exploited in those businesses. I will remind you that I also grew up in a country that until 1996 didn't have its national currency. Mm -hmm. So very often the payment or the way to pay um, in particular women, they were not paid with money. They were paid with services, they were paid with also security for their family that, you know, if you continue working, at least you will have sort of protection from um, this or that mafia. And so this was really dangerous time. And I remember that, you know, for me, that was just my childhood. That mm -hmm. I don't know any other childhood. And for me, that was just my childhood. Um, yet now, in this stage, I'm able to analyze what that time really was and what effect it had on me. And um, um, I want to emphasize something that I really remember and that really affected me a lot and I think had a rather big impact on my, um, on my life in future was the silence and the silence of women. I remember men and women suffering, as I said, and, but I remember men expressing their pain, um, speaking out loud that they're unhappy, that they suffer, that they're humiliated. Women were humiliated two times more Yet they never complained. You never heard a woman complain? I never heard my mother complaining. Never? I knew that she's suffering. I saw how she's suffering. But I remember her silence. And I think that this silence, I don't know if this will make sense, but this silence is so loud in mm -hmm. my head. And uh, this is something that I think um, somehow influenced me to dream to become a journalist, mm -hmm. to go to Kiev and study journalism because I wanted to write, I wanted to speak out. And then somehow it pushed me and led me into the fight. And Where you are because now. I was also, I, I had this dream to become a journalist and I tried to become a journalist, yet I found myself in a situation where I had to contribute and kind of to cover up the corruption mm -hmm. of this system. And I understood that that's not what I dreamt of. And the only way to express yourself then was literally going in the street as simple as that and just shouting and shout. very loud because there was no other way to speak. And why were the women silent? Well, I mean, again, it's, it's about double punishment and double pressure, you know, that you have at work and you have at home. Mm -hmm. And if at home my father could complain about how difficult it was for him um, at work, my mother had a very difficult situation at home too. Mm -hmm. She had to come back and her job and her work would continue. Yes. Taking care of family, uh, cooking dinner when there is no electricity in the city, when the electricity was shut um, down the whole uh, every evening and preparing us to go to school on the next morning. So sh they were living in a continuous, you know, with this continuous feeling of pressure and responsibility mm -hmm. and there was simply no time for no women time to, to complain. complain. <laughs> you said um, uh, you could become a housewife or a prostitute and then you mentioned you started working, which is already quite exceptional, I think, uh, in the climate that you're describing. Um, and then you got fired because you started um, uh, uh, because you joined Thamen. Can you tell me why you joined in the first place? I probably already answered in a way on this question. Um, I joined because, I think because my dream of becoming a journalist collapsed. Mm -hmm. And um, it was this feeling of feeling, you know, being desperate that I might also fail in my life like my parents did. Mm -hmm. That I might not actually realize my dreams and have opportunities just like they did. Because again, this crisis came in the time when my father, my, my father was 35 and my mother was 33. Let's say their best times, yeah, people yeah. say. And they spent a decade or more than a decade um, of, you know, these best times when they could actually um, build uh, their dreams and realize them. Um, they spent it in humiliation and desperacy. And I think that I had this panic inside me, which I still have, I think, um, that, was, that is so deeply rooted that um, I understood that my dream of becoming a journalist and actually, um, you know, having this 
yeah, just contributing to this big utopian idea of Ukrainian population that we're going to be one day a democratic society. And I understood at that time when I got my first job, I was 19 years mm -hmm. old, I was still studying, but I got the job which was considered by everyone uh, as a prestigious job. So I got this job in the um, uh, press office of city mayor, of Kiev city mayor. But it was the biggest humiliation I experienced at that moment of my life because I was actually told what to write had to write, yes. and I was told to lie. And um, I found myself, you know, that I, I literally saw how my dream collapsed, and I didn't have any other dream. Mm. And I wanted to speak out, and I wanted to express myself. And then there was this group of enthusiastic women who suddenly were very, you know, ambitious, um, without knowing a lot how to do, mm -hmm. how to change the society, yet they were saying, we're going to do it. And this enthusiasm, um, their enthusiasm, I think, mirrored my own enthusiasm that suddenly was kind of shut down. And yeah, that's, I found myself in their, in their ambitious way to, you know, to look at things and they were shouting slogans and they were, we had this um, rather simple debate around the table. It was not a very, uh, let's say, uh, sophisticated uh, theoretical conversations about feminism or how mm -hmm. we're going to destroy uh, capitalism, you know. Not at all. It was literally talking, sharing our personal stories and stories of our mothers and basically saying we don't want to live like our mothers, mm -hmm. so how are we going to do it? And yeah, that's you, where I find myself. Do you think that you and these other women not only have to fulfill your own dreams, but also the dreams of your parents? Um, I do think, I often think about this now. And um, uh, in particular, it's strange because I'm thinking that I'm fulfilling more dreams of my father than my mother. Why? And I think because my mother actually never dreamed, mm. because she never allowed herself to dream. And I know that, for example, every time I go for another trip or another aventure in my life, my father shows more excitement. He wants to know more. And my mother just wants to make sure that I'm safe. And, um, and I'm thinking about it a lot. I don't have a ready answer yet. But I think because, indeed, my mother never allowed herself to dream. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so protesting was what happened after you met these women. Um, and you were first against protesting topless. Yes. Why? <laughs> <laughs> um, why? Uh, well, the answer today is very obvious to me and very simple. Um, because I was, not, um, I was not empowered, I was not free in my own body. Because the perception I had about my own body was the perception that society has about me and that society kind of taught me what to think about myself. I had only one idea about my body that is by definition sexual. Mm -hmm. And that's what the way society sees us, that woman's body is sexual by definition in all contexts, in all cases. And that's what I thought about myself too. And so, um, you know, engaging myself in feminine is not only fighting for the cause, for something that is outside me. It was first of all, actually living my personal internal revolution. Mm -hmm. it's go it was going through, just, just going against everything I thought, uh, I, was, I was told and everything I learned about myself before, before that moment. And so it took, it took some time to rethink. And I'm lucky I had these great examples, these girls who were just there and they were sure that what they're doing is right and their messages were right. Um, they were not always right, but they were so powerful and this was inspiring me. And so those girls that I met, I think the best thing that could ever happen to me in my life indeed was to meet okay. Sasha, Oksana, Anna. And this was, yeah, it just changed, it changed me. And then I changed my life, thanks to that. Do you remember the first time, can you describe it, the first time you went uh, and protested topless? I remember. Um, I remember because it was a very special day, not only for me, it was a, a very symbolic day. It was the Independence Day of Ukraine. And so, in a way, I said that that, that was also an, my own Independence Day. <laughs> because... Um, 
So as I said, for a while I was against this topless protest, um, and we, for a while, we we kind of um, one group of feminine activists who were more we considered them more radical. They were doing topless protests, and then the other group to which I belong, <laughs> we were doing more street street theater like protests with a lot of colors, balloons, banners that nobody mm -hmm. read. Um, and um, so, but every time there was this topless protest happening, I saw the reaction of society, I saw the reaction of media, I saw violent comments, and I actually understood that nobody saw that nudity that, be, that was political nudity, nobody considered it to be sexual anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I saw that the bodies of other women, of my fellow friends, were not sexual, while I still was perceiving my own body to be sexual. So there was this long process of self-questioning and, um, and looking at others, women who were examples for me, and uh, then this took a lot of months, many months, a lot of time for me. And then I decided to join um, this radical group <laughs> of, uh, of feminine girls for the Independence Day, and I remember very clearly that I was, so, I was very anxious of mm -hmm. going topless. And I remember once I took off my top and it was, I, was, I was paralyzed for a second because I was like, what? You don't feel naked. You don't feel naked. I did naked. not feel naked. Not a second. I did not feel naked in that moment. I was standing in front of a square, mm -hmm. in the middle of a square, in the center of the city, in front of cameras, people, my fellow um, activists who were with me, I knew I had this slogan and I knew why I was there. And I was there not for, a, I was there for political purpose. Mm -hmm. And you don't feel naked because you understand that your body will be sexual when you decided to be sexual. And this very body can be political if you decide that it can be political. And I made this decision for myself that I'm going to use this body as a political poster. It's going to be my own democracy wall. I'm going to write my slogans and the voice that I don't have, um, the expressions that I, you know, the, the words that I don't have possibility to express, they're going to be expressed through my body, mm -hmm. on my body. And everyone who will want to look at another naked woman and will come to look at me, they will be able to look at the naked body, yet they will not be able to ignore what this body says. Do you remember their looks the first time? I remember. It was a lot of confusion. People were, you know, people were laughing or people were screaming. There was a, every reaction was very emotional. Mm -hmm. And I know why it was very emotional, because it's just challenged stereotypes of people about women, about what women do with their bodies, same as my my stereotypes were challenged just before that mm -hmm. protest. And um, everyone who would pass by would react. Um, nobody would feel, uh, you know, ignorant to what's going on because suddenly we were, re we were just suddenly proposing another image of what naked woman's body can be. A, a redefinition of woman's body. That's what feminine protests are about, redefining woman's body and making it a political tool, political instruments, taking it out from um, our, you know, taking it... This, this naked body was always in the center of women's oppression as an instrument in the hands of oppressors. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing, we're saying we're going to take it back. We're going to put it in the center of our own liberation and it will be in our hands as it's our ours. own instrument. And then um, you said about the reactions, they are aggressive sometimes as well. What is it you think that triggers the, the aggression? As I said, we, you know, I think, I think that, let me come from the other side. I think that feminism is not just about liberating women from patriarchal oppression. Feminist fight is also about liberating men from patriarchal oppression. And, you know, it's, it's, about, it's about liberating men from this toxic masculinity to which they have to adhere to exist in this society. And so what we were doing suddenly, we were coming in front of men, we were naked, but we were angry. We were mm -hmm. not smiling. And these men could not understand what's going on. 
for them it was, you know, this naked woman's body is supposed to be there to serve, you know, to please me, to entertain mm -hmm. me, you know, to or for other men to be as a tool of enrichment. But it would never be the body that would go against this male system. And suddenly, there it was. And they feel threatened. They feel they're, um, the image that they have to correspond to was suddenly threatened. But I think, I'm convinced, and I know it. It's not just the belief. I know it because there are many men behind us and support us. I know that many men are actually happy that we challenge this patriarchal vision of men and women, mm -hmm. of both. And that's very important, you know. So feminism is not just a fight of women, it's really a fight for both. It's just really about reshaping the society. Um, would you allow men to join your protest? Our protest, no. No? <laughs> Our movement, why, yes. Yes, and why not? Um, we do have male members in the movement, um, members. Mm -hmm. They're supporters, they're those who help us to do those protests. Yet, um, since we put women's body in the center of this fight, mm -hmm. um, naked men's body, naked women's body have a very different significance in this society mm -hmm. and believe me very different reactions what is the difference <laughs> in reaction I, don't, I mean seriously you just i don't know i can't talk about amsterdam but if you walk around paris you see topless men on the, you know when it's hot mm -hmm. uh, topless men uh, running around feeling free and not threatened they feel mm -hmm. safe they're safe in any situation mm -hmm. and their bodies are safe that's the key of this question while woman's body is always threatened, even if it's dressed, you know, and more covered it is, it's even more threatened, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so it's really, if we put in the center of our fight, and that's what we do in our case, woman's, woman's naked body, men's naked body, just, just on the side, you know, just with us would not have the same impact. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also, it's woman's turn to just to just act, to unite, and mm -hmm. to speak, and to make themselves vi visible. We're happy, and we, we want, and we need men to support us, but mm -hmm. let us do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm always a little bit skeptic about uh, uh, the men, also because uh, here in the Netherlands, I think there's a bit of a narrative where, um, um, and you said it as well, that there's a thing that men also gain from feminism. And you, think, you also think that, what, what do they gain? I think that indeed they gain also freedom to be who they want to be mm -hmm. and not that masculine, sexist man that has the power, mm -hmm. should not show his emotions, you know, and have to provide for everyone and has to be a, a, an animal, you know, and so on and so forth. I mean, you know, and all of this patriarchal image of men too. So I think they gain freedom to be what they can be, what they want to be, sensitive, weak, mm -hmm. uh, just to be a human being um, like. that, they, that they are mm -hmm. and not correspond to one image. You know, for me, it's, it's really why I said it's about freedom of men and women. It's really about freedom of men and women to be what they want to be, to be different. Mm -hmm. And we are all different. I know very tough women mm -hmm. who do not show any emotions, not because they were taught, they indeed, that's how they feel, comfortable. And I know men, very emotional men. And this does not make those men less men and those women less women, right? Mm -hmm. We are seven billion on this planet and we can't just correspond to two images, two standard images mm -hmm. of, you know, their woman and their man. That's the religious way. You know, that's a very dogmatic religious way. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, this fight is about opening up and letting really people to be what they want to be and how they feel. And do you think that men are ready to give up their privileges? Um, I think they are not ready. Some, many men are not ready to give up their privileges, same as many women are not ready to take their liberties. Mm -hmm. And um, this is again, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's about reshaping mentalities and letting people feel, understand that they, they have this freedom. They have to take the freedom to, you know, to be what they want to be. And um, 
it was interesting. Just some time ago, I was talking with um, with a male priest, mm -hmm. um, and I asked him, and he was supporting um, a movement of women, a women's priesthood movement, and he was the only man in this group. And I asked him, why would a man, a religious man, would give up? his privileges giving to him by definition, just per se, just because he's a man. Why would you find yourself here and not, uh, you know, somewhere near another uh, priest pedophile, you know? <laughs> and he said to me, um, he said to me, because that's, I also want my freedom. And so he was another, it was a priest, I repeat, and he was just another example of a man who understood that uh, these institutions, this society, do not give him personal freedom to be what he wants to be. And then I found out that this man is a gay man. And he's, and he's also persecuted by mm -hmm. this very religious institution that also persecutes women. Mm -hmm. And yet he's a religious person, but he understands that his religion also discriminates him as a man because he's a different from that image of a man that you, you, he's supposed to be according to religion, according to patriarchal society. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm convinced that it's really about both. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are some men, I agree with you on that, who are ready to give up their privileges. So how, and how, I was wondering, how are we going to get the minority to do that? To get? The minor, ma majority of them to do it. You know, sometimes I just think that it's really, <laughs> It's really just coming and taking it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really just about us taking it. And sometimes it's, that's really the answer. It's not letting that, it's not waiting that someone's gonna let or give away their privileges. Yes, you're right, that majority of them maybe would not. Mm -hmm. it's, about, it's for us to come and take it. It's really that, that's my answer. Maybe in some years I'll have better answer or someone else has here more you know, elaborated answer. But what I know, what really works now is it's really about going yourself and taking it. It's not, you know, I, I always t repeat to um, my fellow activists or to women who come and see me and say how to be powerful like you, and mm -hmm. I tell them, I explain them, uh, you know, it's not about being born powerful. It's about deciding to be powerful. It's about stopping asking yourself, who's gonna let me be free? It's about asking yourself, who's gonna stop me from being free? Mm -hmm. That's the answer, you know, and that's the key for us women to kind of catch up with men and get this sacred, holy equality we all hope for. But then, um, uh, I think you're right. I think it's a lot about decision making and deciding not to be, f be, not to have fear and not to feel fear anymore. And at the same time, it has cost you a lot. So I can also imagine women saying, you know, this whole situation, at least I get to live in my country, of course. for instance. So how do you make, how, I'm wondering how to push, how to push the movement. Um, do you have to push these you know, women a I, little? I know with my story, with my experience, it's true that I know the tough way, mm -hmm. um, how to do it. And it's not because I choose the tough way. No. It's because society, is you know choosing to react tough and with violence on women uh, like myself who say I'm going to take it, mm -hmm. I'm going to go for it, I'm going to demand it. And um, again, uh, yeah, I'm sitting here for a I'm 29 years old, and uh, um, already nearly three times I've been killed in my life. I know what is torture, I know what, what, what is to be kidnapped. But I will ensure you, I didn't want to know all of that. No, and I don't want anyone not. to know all of no. that. And I didn't, some of the protests that I did, I didn't think that it might end up the way it ended up. And I don't want to repeat it. I tell you honestly, I don't want to go through the same things I already went through. Uh, because everything that happens to you, you, it's not something that happens in that horrible moment. It's something that you have to live with the rest of your life. And uh, I don't, Unfortunately, yeah, I don't want any other woman to go through the same path that we had to go through, but unfortunately, I also don't know other way. No. I know that this fight sometimes has consequences and very tough consequences for many women. And just as we speak here in this safe, nice room, um, 
you know, I, that's true that some people can say, oh, well, famine, this is radical, and what we did is radical. And it's true, going um, against, you know, face to face to dictators is, you know, it's not everybody would do that. And I don't want everyone to do that. But as we're speaking right now, um, there are women in Iran who are, who are not doing that radical thing. What they're doing, no. they just take off a scarf, right? I know. And they go, they, they risk d decades or several decades in prison. Today, there was this 21 years old woman who, released, who posted her video. She was condemned to 20 years of jail just because she did simple act of taking off a headscarf. You know, it's really not, so at, at the end, it's not about, it's not about doing some big radical act. A very little simple act can cost you freedom and security. Um, but I think if we are more and more doing it, and of course sacrificing at one point our personal freedom and our mm -hmm. personal security, there's a cost, yes. Uh, you know, there is this saying, freedom is not free. Mm -hmm. We have to pay price very often. And people who did, you know, even if I complain about a lot of um, insecurity, about a lot of injustices, discrimination that I personally suffered, but I also know the generation of my mother and my mother herself, she suffered more than I did. And it's thanks to them, to their suffering that I can suffer less. And the same thing will happen to, hopefully, to a generation of, you know, the, the, the young girls that are growing up right now, that are five years old right now. And maybe it's thanks to us, to those who right now will sit in jail in Iran, maybe the next generation of Iranian girls will be free to wear or to not wear headscarf, and maybe headscarf will just be forgotten forever. Mm -hmm. Oh, God's sake. <laughs> 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 I think that's one of the most uh, 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 beautiful things of your movement, that it's not a national movement, but it's a very international movement, and it shows a great uh, a solidarity. Um, how did that start? Because I can imagine it's already quite intense just fighting for women's rights in Ukraine. How did you start fighting for... How did you start uniting with all these women in other countries? I'll tell you, honestly, it's not our... It's not something you have to praise us, Ukrainian girls, for this. It's actually something uh, that happened naturally, thanks to women in France, in, in Sweden, in, in Germany, in Belgium, in Canada, in Turkey, in Tunisia, who said, I'm going to also use my body mm -hmm. as my political tool, and wrote their slogan, sometimes without even being part of the movement, mm -hmm. just doing it, just taking this tactic over and using it in their own context. So it's women of the world that, has to be, that have to be praised for expanding famine to international level. And uh, it happened in 2012 uh, that the movement started kind of growing on its own as mm -hmm. more and more women in different countries said, we're going to use this tactic to react on our problems in our country. And I was, at that time, I was, leaving, I was running away from my country and so I uh, went into exile in France and somehow it happened that we had this opportunity to build this international movement of famine. Yet today I will tell you honestly that I think that idea, famine idea, is already beyond famine movement. Mm -hmm. It's much bigger than the movement that we built. Uh, because I see, for example, suddenly you know, I open news or I open Twitter and I see women in Brazil who protest against Bolsonaro using famine tactic. They have flower crowns, they have their slogans, um, and they protest against sexism and oppression in their country, while they're not even famine activists. Mm -hmm. I see women even in Hong Kong right now using this tactic, and I just understand that it's already more than us, than what we build our groups. And that's at least that's how what I feel, and that's I personally, I don't know if other activists of the movement share this, this kind of aspiration that I have, but that's what I hope that that's the future of the movement. It will just yeah. go beyond the movement. <laughs> and then to speak about the future in general, are you hopeful? You know, I think that uh, the answer is very simple, yes. Because yes. you just can't be an activist and not be a dreamer and not be an utopist and not be a little bit too much enthusiastic. We all have to be a little bit crazy mm -hmm. <laughs> to do all of this, you know? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I'm gonna ask anyway, even though you are you are on a Probably. hopeful role, <laughs> because uh, 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 I'm not super hopeful. Also, because uh, 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 maybe it's because of, um, that's the reason I'm not an activist. But also because <laughs> I I know, but I see a lot of men, young men, young men that are uh, uh, in their twenties having these really conservative uh, conservative uh, 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 thoughts again. And I thought, well, we're, you know, we're, we're on a roll, we're past that, we're emancipating. And then I, I see them posting things and thinking things that, that, that want to bring women back to the kitchen and, and with their mouths shut. And I'm sometimes quite worried. You're right, but I also see a lot of um, conservative ideas spoken by women too. Mm -hmm. And um, this is right. Yes, this is true. And you know, I think that there is a good thing. One good thing about it. And the good thing is that now we see it. And before we just mm -hmm. didn't see it. We ignored it. We just it, didn't maybe. have a possibility to know what actually young people think mm -hmm. or what people think. And now with social media, with the exchange, you know, with the internet, and with with all the tools that we have, we actually can feel better at what stage the society is. And I will ensure you there were always men who wanted women to be in the kitchen. And they are also today, in the young generation too, they are those men. But it's good we see them. And be sure there were much more before. Okay. On the other hand, I, will, I want to tell you that indeed, it's, it's, it, it's a fact that today um, we're experiencing a backlash against women's rights. But this backlash is, is a backlash on the successes mm -hmm. of feminist movement. It is a backlash against this new uh, worldwide campaign of women's voices speaking out, the Me Too movement. So all these misogynies that are come uh, right now come out, for them it's a, you know, it's a kind of a save me scream. They just want to hope that they still will have an opportunity to exist. And so, yeah, maybe I'm a little bit too much hopeful, but that's my job. That's OK. Um, you know, and I think that there is a backlash on our successes. Mm -hmm. And so our job right now to be the backlash against backlash. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask a few more questions before we also go to the audience. Um, because I, when I was researching this, there's one, there was a number I ran into. And um, uh, uh, it made me a bit emotional because I read that violence against women. So 23% of men have seen their father being violent towards their mother. That's almost one third of a country in Ukraine, this is. And I was wondering, uh, how, how can you? Because it repeats itself. Um, how can you break that? You know, uh, domestic violence is not, uh, is, is not just a question a prob or a problem of societies like Ukraine. No, I know obviously, it happens here as like well. The obviously sexist society. It was just a number that I yes, read. But it's a worldwide tragedy, a drama. And um, finally, it's only now, only recently, we started talking about gender-based crimes. Mm -hmm. Before, for example, domestic violence was considered to be, a, you know, very often in the media, it would be like a, a passionate crime. Yes. It would be described like this, or a family drama. But we have to, we finally arrived to the stage where we recognize that women are killed because they're women. Women are suffering forms of violence just because they're women. It's a gender-based crimes. It's not just violence, it's a, it's a very specific form of violence. And again, I think because th those numbers are right now available, that's mm -hmm. already a progress. A decade ago, we didn't even have those numbers. No. And you know that today in France, for example, we are counting, every day we are counting a new victim of, uh, every second day, a new victim of um, feminicide, or femicide in English, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we are counting them. We right now, we know that there are women killed as a result of domestic violence. Well, a decade ago, even in France, the country of feminism, of human rights, you know, even there, nobody considered even talking about gender-based crimes. And just, I mean, I'm in France already since six years, mm -hmm. and just even two years ago, 
um, every time a woman would be killed under some specific cir circumstances as a result of domestic violence, the headlines would be a family drama, yes. a passionate crime, as if a man kills a woman out of a passion. Mm -hmm. No, a man kills a woman as any other killing out of hate. And uh, there is, it's a fact that there is a war on women and this war is happening and taking place in the streets, in parliaments, but also at homes. And again, I think that there is a progress in the fact that we are raising awareness, awareness about it. And of course, raising awareness is always one of the ways of fighting it. And the next stage is, of course, effective legislation mm -hmm. is a protection. It's not only, it's not, but effective, why I say effective legislation, it's not about just having a law against domestic violence, no. It's actually having instruments to protect victims of domestic violence, to protect, to, to also treat victims of domestic violence, as well as treat perpetrators. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about having um, access, giving access to victims of domestic violence, housing, uh, economic support, job support. You know, because many of victims of domestic violence, they, even those who go to police station, they complain, but then they go back home to the perpetrator. Yes. Because they simply don't have any other solution in their life. Death or the police doesn't and take them serious. And that's our job of the society mm -hmm. to fight for those excesses that should be given to victims of domestic violence and that's the fight of today. And that is something you're doing right now with the G7, you told me. Right. Um, well, um, it's not specifically about domestic violence, but I, 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 I um, worked uh, with other fellow activists from uh, all, all, all around the world. There was an independent advisory um, committee formed with the 35 activists and experts in women's rights. Um, and we were asked to make a list of legislations that mm -hmm. we would like to be adopted in all G7 countries, legislations that would um, improve the situation of women. And we listed 80 illustrative laws mm -hmm. and the principles of application, because again, it's not just about the law. It's really about mechanisms, effective mechanisms of, of, of application. And I personally worked on the question of violence against women, but um, uh, we, we worked on the question of domestic violence. And for example, one of the recommendation, or I prefer to say demands, mm -hmm. they prefer to say recommendation okay. as a diplomatic <laughs> language, <laughs> but I, we'll I go with demands. demands. <laughs> um, and one of those demands was indeed the um, providing access to victims of domestic violence to, again, housing, financial, psychological, and legal help, so that those crimes do not end up with actual killing of women. Because it's a fact that um, women who, um, the victims of feminicides, so women who got killed uh, as a result of domestic violence, are the victims of domestic violence for you know, for a while, it's a continuous mm -hmm. violence against those women, and it's those the, yeah. in these cases very often it ends up with a feminicide. And so, to prevent um, the the death of women, we have to immediately prevent domestic violence. And so, you know, sometimes when um, you know, I I had an opportunity to speak in front of some political leaders and. What I told them is that, you know, us activists, let's be also re realistic, that us activists, even, even if we have various opportunities, but our job is to speak out, to put the light on the problems, and sometimes even suggest solutions. Mm -hmm. But it's still the job of politicians to save lives, and they still have the power to do it. It's our, in our power to speak out, but it's in their power to save lives. So. It's, let's also not forget that it's not to activists to no. write laws and create help centers for victims of uh, domestic violence. It's to governments and politicians to do it, and our job is to demand it louder. Um, you've been demanding things, and for almost 10 years, more than 10 years? 10 years. 10 now. years yes. now. <laughs> what is the uh, result you're the most proud of? 
um, you know, there are, of course, we can go through some actions, some, com some campaigns, mm -hmm. and I can tell you this was successful, this was very powerful, this influenced many women but and many people. I want to know what made you the But most I proud. will tell you something. There is something that makes me very proud as I sit right now in front of you at this very moment. The, the biggest result, I think, of this movement is this every woman that was part of it, or still part of it, or that will be part of it, maybe when I, from, when I will be already somewhere else, mm -hmm. I don't know. So it's this every woman who, that joins this movement. Because I know that every woman who joined this movement, even for a short time, she had this process of interior, internal revolution for herself mm -hmm. that I also experienced. And you know, just standing um, near, a, other fellow women who shout out loud their slogans and use their body as a political tool, that's the biggest result of my fight, to have other women feeling powerful, you know, yes. with their body and their voices. And that's the most beautiful and the greatest results that for me personally that I count. Yet, of course, I remember one of, for example, most remembering moments, now that I see Nadia sitting in front of me, um, was our campaign um, in Tunisia that Nadia was also, uh, in a way, part of um, and supported a lot, and Mariam, and I mean, we were, we were many, um, uh, which was initiated by a Tunisian young girl that we indeed didn't know at that time, mm -hmm. and she went for her, her personal protest. She published this photo of, top, uh, of herself topless with the slogan, um, on her body, claiming that she's the only owner of her own body. And I remember, so, and she suffered consequences. She was in prison. She had a, a very violent reaction of her family. And then we all together, joining forces, we built this international campaign mm -hmm. that we famine, we called it Topless Jihad. Mm -hmm. uh, but the campaign in support of Amina and um, you know, in support of our activists who were also imprisoned there. And this campaign took place all over the world. Mm -hmm. And we gave a call to everyone, to all women, to send us photos of themselves with the slogan to support Amina and her liberation. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember the day when we woke up and we opened email and we received hundreds of photos of women. But I remember the... the the most beautiful thing was about it, that many women from Arab world, from Muslim countries, were sending pictures of themselves topless with slogans. Some of them were covering mm -hmm. their face. Some of them were writing us their stories that usually in their life, in their daily life, they wear, um, you know, they wear hijab mm -hmm. because that's how they feel and whatever, they have their reasons. Yet for this campaign in support of Amina, they took off their tops while keeping their hijabs. So, that's you know, brilliant. that was very powerful and it was very strong. And um, I hope that those women who wore hijab and were topless right now are without hijab, I'm quite sure. Um, but, you know, that was, I remember that was very powerful. And that's ag again what makes me most proud is empowering, you know, as I was empowered by other women, mm -hmm. I know that I also could empower others. And that's the most important, the biggest goal. Of every woman, I think. Right? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think this might be a nice time to see if anybody has a question. Does anybody have a question? I'm going to pick up the... Thank. A comment is also good. <laughs> I will hold it. Yeah, I work with the views woman and... Uh, uh. And I realized that you talk about chain going around. The reality is um, when uh, the children watch their father, seeing their mother is abused by the father, and that's how the mother becomes in control of the father and would become submissive. So therefore, they pick up this notion that that's the only way to talk to a woman. But also, the woman the girls of the family, they become either violent because they are rebellious against what's happening, or they become very depressed. So one of our demand is 
to make sure that a part of being housed and financially helped, but also to make sure that these children receive counseling, so as the mother. Okay. Otherwise, this chain would continue going on. So in order to break this chain, these children, they need to go counseling, and the counseling would focus on equality between men and women, and we call it less talk, so that the children can talk while they're playing with us in order to become in a healthy situation. That's mm. it. Thank you. Thank you. you. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, it's just uh, as a quick reaction to this comment, is just to tell again to other people who are present in this room, it's really about treating society. It's really, that, do you understand how big is this job? It's not just treating women, right, who are oppressed or who are victims. It's also treating perpetrators. And then it's treating those who observed all these crimes. It's, yeah, our fight is really about, about treating the society, saving it from itself, right? <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm coming towards you. <laughs> I admire you guys because you're reshaping the society so that individuals would gain the freedom of what they want to do with their own bodies. And that's what we want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, I think we have room for two more. Yes, in the back. I will come to you after that. I hold it. Oh yeah, that's not good. <laughs> um, well, thank you for being here. Um, you're an inspiration for me as well, but I will not take my top off today. <laughs> um, I had a question about <laughs> about the social media era that we are in, and you already lightened a little bit that we see younger people actually become more have conservative views or align themselves with, let's say, alt right, mm -hmm. um, especially women. I was wondering how is this like culture, because basically Instagram or Twitter, it's all about getting the likes. How do you, th do you think that it's actually threatening the social media era? Thank you. Because of the liking culture? Um, I think that, uh, of course, this, yeah, it's, it, uh, the social media incorporated this idea that we all, you know, th this old idea is not a new idea of getting a like. Before, we were told that we have to get like in real life from fellow men to be accepted, you know, getting a like. And now we also have to do it um, on social media. Um, but, you know, speaking of social media, I think that still it also, there are also, it also became a very, very massive um, support for people like us. It became a massive support for people who want to tell their stories and who were not heard, who were marginalized, usually in those societies where, again, you have to correspond to one image. So, um, you know, as everything is, uh, has a, you know, both sides, and I, I still, I think I appreciate this um, a lot, the, the, the appearance of social media, even though, of course, as everything else, it has to be, uh, saved and ca somehow kind of uh, regulated. But, you know, it's like ca speaking again about this conservatism that we see in social media and in real life and everything. I think it's also coming back to this idea of backlash and the rise of the, of the uh, conservative movement, far right movement that we're going to talk about tomorrow. I think that those ideas usually in history, and today is that very moment as well, I think those ideas are becoming actual and becoming valuable only in the times of crisis as well. That's the only time when they actually can exist. When the, the ideas and the values that we have do not, you know, do, do not correspond anymore to the world that we're living in, when, um, when, when there is a need of change, those ideas get a chance for relevance. And uh, for example, today we see, of course, it's, we are literally uh, at the stage of, of really saving our species and our planet. And it's, it's a time of, of a great, of a huge anxiety for everyone, for, for the whole world. And it's in this time that these ideas get 
you know, a chance to be relevant, to kind of criticize the actual system, which should be criti criticized indeed, because it does not correspond anymore to our needs and to the challenges that we have. It just does not answer anymore to the challenges we have. And that's why this conservative, this far right um, fascist ideas, xenophobic ideas, get the chance to exist for some short time. And so I think our job is not to let those ideas to be the only ones that provide solutions. And, um, uh, you know, it's very important that we, we keep coming up with our voices and do not get silenced by, by those very loud, populistic, far-right voices and their threats too. So it's about providing alternatives to them too. And, for example, when we, I think that everybody who participates in this conference and who criticizes in particular, for example, Islam, very often we hear, oh, you have the same speech as the far-right xenophobes. Why do you do that? You just help them. But I think that what helps them most is our silence, because then they're the only ones on the stage to speak, you know? And what they say is they literally attack people, the people, while we uh, try to keep, you know, to keep the debates and, uh, on the level of ideas and talk about values and about messages we want to give to our societies and new generation. And when people always, when, when, for example, feminine actions against um, political Islam and political Islamic groups were um, also quite radical and very loud. And there was one journalist who asked me, but so you did this protest against... Uh, these uh, misogynist imams, but what's the difference between you and Marine Le Pen? <laughs> you know, because Marine Le Pen also attacks Muslims. And I told him, but that's the key. Marine Le Pen attacks Muslims. While we attack degrading Islamic ideas that also affect and attack many Muslims too, many people in Muslim community. So it's really for us to, to for our voices to exist more and to be there against the far-right religious and against the far-right political. We should not leave them the stage, because then, indeed, people start voting for them, because they understand there is a problem with those political movements, with the Islamist movements, and they want someone to be there as an opposition. And if the only opposition possible is Marine Le Pen and Front National, they're going to support them. So it's for us to be this another alternative, not the fascist alternative, but humanistic alternative, yet brave enough to criticize what's wrong with the ideas while not attacking people. I have room for one, one more question. Okay. Um, I'm going to come to you, sorry. So I'm just wondering if there's a distinction. I'm asking this question because a friend of mine works in local government and she runs support groups for women uh, who suffer from domestic violence, particularly in South Asian and Islamic communities. And she said that in one of the sessions, one of the women who had been suffering domestic violence herself said about the other woman, but if she cooked her husband food, and did what she was supposed to do, then her husband wouldn't beat her. And so we know that sometimes even, and this was a woman who was suffering domestic violence herself, so we know that sometimes the perpetuation of misogyny isn't only done by men, but it's also done by women. And I wonder whether as an activist who's so experienced in this field, you have a different tactic or whether for addressing women to men, or whether you use the same tactic across all groups within society. Thank you. So, to, I have an official answer and unofficial answer. <laughs> My official answer that is, I do not make difference. And indeed, I keep speaking my ideas out, whoever is in front of me. My unofficial answer um, is that who, Whenever a woman is in front of me, whoever she is, whatever her political views um, are, whether she supports me or she hates me and she fights me, I still know that eventually she will be on our side. And I'm, I'm secretly a friend of her, even <laughs> though I'm fighting her at that very moment. <laughs> so I think that is it. Ina Chevchenko.
thank you so much for thank being you. here and thank for you. talking to us. Thank you very well. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. We're done. You'll be here tomorrow again uh, yes. at 11. And uh, for everyone here, um, you think you are finished, uh, but you're not because uh, Saifu Malukas just landed uh, um, and he's very happy to come and speak here at 10. So I really hope you uh, uh, will stay around for that. That would be wonderful. But we have a, a, a small break in between. So I'll see you Great. here at 10, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>